looks like it's six o'clock. I'm going to call our meeting to order um, for the Transportation Advisory Board meeting for Monday, February the 14th, 2022. Let's begin with the roll call. Sandra Stewart. Present. Liz Osborne. Here. Courtney Michelle. Here. David McInerney. Present. Steve Lehner. Present. Council Member Yarbrough. Present. May I have a motion to approve the minutes from the January 10th, 2022 meeting for the tra Transportation Advisory Board meeting? Um, I move that we approve the meetings from the last board meeting. Is there a second? Liz, is there any discussion? Okay. So it's been moved and seconded to approve the minutes from the January uh, 10th, 2022 meeting. Um, all those are, that are approved um, signify by saying yes. 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 Opposed? None. Okay. It's been, um, the minutes have been approved with um, 100%. Okay. I see that Diane's here now. Okay. Is there any communication from staff, Tyler or Phil? Steve. I think Phil's got a couple items he's going to mention real quick. Hey, good evening, uh, members of the Transportation Advisory Board, and uh, appreciate your time tonight. Unfortunately, you're going to have to hear me a lot tonight, so I apologize for that up front, but uh, we'll try to make this fairly quick and fairly painless. So, um, but I do have a couple items from staff. One item is kind of benign, and it's maybe not really important to this group, but uh, we've been searching for an airport manager for the last couple of months. As you know, um, our last airport manager, David Slater, passed away to, passed away unexpectedly a number of months ago in September. So we've been on a search for his replacement, um, and uh, that's going fairly well. It took a long time, obviously, but we will have a new airport manager on board, hopefully, in, in, in the next two months. I only mention this because um, part of my duties now are going to be to take over the supervisory role of that uh, position. So that's a new thing for for all of us, I guess. And so um, I just want to let the TAB know, as uh, you may hear more and more from the airport, there is an airport advisory board that's separate, but we're really working hard with this uh, with this new person as they come on board is to uh, make sure that they are part of the city and more interwoven into what we do at a city level than was typical of the last two managers. So you'll see more and more things, I think, come into play with transportation and the airport. So I just wanted to give you a heads up on that. Are there any questions on that issue or that item? And I'd like to roll into the idea that, uh, um, and I'm gonna get this wrong. I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask Tyler to look up the acronym for me um, for RAIS, and he might know it off the top of his head. Um, I've already forgotten it, but we're going for a raise grant, R-A-I-S-E, and it really is the new type of grants for larger federal projects or larger federal grants. And so I just wanted to give everybody on this board a heads up that we're working with Boulder County, the city of Boulder, the Colorado Department of Transportation and the Regional Transportation District, RTD and CDOT are the acronyms there. Uh, and we're all going after a grant for Highway 119 between Longmont and Boulder to get that bus rapid transit project off the ground. And so um, we've gone in the past, we've gone for these grants and uh, not been successful because we're going for a grant that was just a very limited uh, intersection in the city of Longmont. And though we had the support of all these other groups, it wasn't a very corridor ranging project. It was very Longmont specific. And so we've learned through debriefs from these different groups that uh, evaluate for these grants that that's not what they were looking for. 
they're looking for more collaboration along a corridor. And so we're not going to go for the grant this time. CDOT is, which I think is a good start, first of all, just to have them at the front of this and finally showing that kind of leadership that we've been looking for um, for this specific grant. So just wanted to give you a heads up and we'll tell you more about that as we kind of produce it and it, it comes together. We'll uh, make sure that you get to see that and make sure you have all the information at your disposal if you have any questions. And Tyler was nice enough to help me out with the Rebuilding America infrastructure and the sustainability and, and it disappeared. Um, but anyway, and, and equity. So, yes, ma'am. My question is, uh, is it going to change the design or the plan of um, Highway 119, the Russ Bus Rapid Transit? It seemed like that was pretty well set what you what we were planning on doing. So do you anticipate changes with CDOT taking over? Well, again, it's going to be more of a corridor wide plan and just a corridor or our specific project, but our specific project does stay within the new raise grant request. So okay. though we're asking for a lot more money for the corridor, for the entire corridor. And with the infrastructure and jobs uh, act that was passed earlier, that's there's some more money that's available to projects like this. So that's nice as well for us to to be able to go after some additional dollars. But our project will stay in the mix, which we're very excited about. But we're, there'll be other projects south of Longmont along the line as well. And that project has really transitioned from more of a bus rapid transit piece to more of a, well, it was going to be managed lanes, which is what you'll see on I-25 as you drive into Denver. You'll see the lanes where you can either pay for them or if you have a carpool of three plus, three or more people, uh, you can drive in those for free. Um, or if you're on a bus, you can you can obviously take the bus in those lanes for free as well. So um, we are not going to be able to do that in the diagonal corridor, the State Highway 119 corridor, because it's all, you know, signalized intersections, at grade intersections that don't have interchanges. So to have somebody pay to get into those wasn't viable because you're only paying to get to the next stoplight. And we can't guarantee that a car can get through that without stopping, but we're, we are going to try to make it so the buses get through without with minimal with minimal slowdown, um, except at the stops, obviously, where they have to come to a complete stop and let people on and off. But um, so it's going to be more of what's called a queue jump, where the buses get to kind of slide past everybody in the left lane, go up to the signal, and the signal should change for that bus, and everybody else has to stop. And so the bus will get to go through. And then the traffic, the rest of the traffic will kind of do its own thing as it was before. But the, the benefit will really go to the bus buses in this new in this new system. So it's a little bit of a change, yes, but it's not um it's still bus rapid transit along the corridor. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh Phil, is the raise grant money, is that federal money that's already been granted to the state of Colorado? No, it's uh, it's federal money that's been allocated for all the projects around the country. And so we are, we are um, going up against and competing with all sorts of other projects around the country. So every, all 50 states plus territories get to get to apply for this grant and compete. So, yeah, it's a, it's a tough, it's a, it's a tough contest <laughs> and we and we've not had the, a lot of money in the past in a pool but this year they're actually um, breaking it into two calls for projects so we're going to do the spring call is what it's called and there's a fall call and so we will go for all of these until we hopefully get it or we'll do whatever it we'll do whatever is kind of requested of us in order to i shouldn't say it like that but we'll we'll listen to the debrief and whatever we can do to kind of make it a better project we'll do. But we think that this project up front has a lot of uh, potential. And uh, Tyler, you might want to add something. Well, I think the only thing I wanted to mention, Phil, and and you know this as well, that um, I think CDOT is only intending to apply for two, submitting two applications. So I think they're pretty selective as well in what they're putting forward. And I think that bodes well for us and kind of the regional collaboration working together and, and nice to get CDOT support on this one as well. 
Yeah, we were not able to get that before. We were able to get CDOT the, the region support, the, the region that is makes makes up Boulder County and Weld County and all the counties kind of on the east northeast quad, quadrant of the state here, but we weren't able to get the, the governor's signature on it. So that's what we're looking for this time. Will, yes, the, will the bike path be included in the grant proposal? Uh, well, the bike path is being looked at in a number of different ways. And so this grant proposal will, um, part of it will go to the bike, the bike way, but we're looking at some other grant opportunities that are more multimodal focused on, you know, alternative transportation only. Mm -hmm. So that will be, that'll be the focus of some other grant opportunities that we're looking for as well. So a uh, great question because the bikeway is going to be bikeway kind of gets piecemeal from everybody gets piecemealed in by all sorts of different funding opportunities, but we're going to try to get it all in there um, with all the different grant opportunities we can look for. And I'll be talking a little bit more about that in my next segment. <laughs> Any other questions for Phil at the moment? All right. Thank you, Phil. Um, Tyler, has it changed or is there any um, public wanting to be heard tonight? I don't see any public invited to be heard on the call. Okay. All right. I see that we don't have any action items unless things have changed. No. Okay. Um, information items. So, Phil, you're going to talk to us about Dr. Cog. Yeah, again, I just wanted to update the group because these are things that are going to kind of come in front of you in the next couple months and just want to prep you and get you ready for some of this and get some questions that you might have uh, you know, addressed as quickly as possible. You may have some things that I, I need to kind of go back and research and get information back to you. But every four years, it's not every two years, I, I, I misspoke there. Sometimes it's two years, but most typically it's every four years. In fact, it was during the last Olympics, we kind of joked about it today, that uh, in the last Winter Olympics, we were working with the Denver Regional Council of Governments, also known as Dr. Cog. I think you all love that acronym. Um, they issue a call for projects every four years. And this year, it's going to be a little different where they're going to, they're going to do some other things because of that infusion of cash uh, from the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. Um, so this year, there's going to be four calls for projects rather than the typical two. What, what, we, what we did last time was uh, we split things into. Well, be, I'll go back to kind of the beginning of time here. Is the, is the transportation improvement program used to be this this thing where we'd all just every city, every county, we'd all just kind of throw in our projects and compete against each other, and the Denver Regional Council of Governments, Dr. Cog, would. Kind of judiciate the whole thing and 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 uh, make sure you know the projects met the, the the broader goals of the region. And if you if you met basically the goals of the region, you would get picked. Your project would get picked to move forward and get some funding. Uh, four years ago, they changed it up on us a little bit, and they they decided that they would move it into kind of the regionally significant projects. And so, twenty percent of the dollars went to these massive kind of more regional projects. And 80% of that money was set aside for just the locals. And they really decided that for the locals to compete, every county should get kind of what they are allocated by population and vehicle miles traveled and employment. And so they use those, those data sets to decide how much each, each county should get from the pool because quite frankly, Boulder County always pulled the most <laughs> because we 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 had city of boulder we had boulder county and and longmont quite frankly the three of us were pretty good at doing these grants and so there was a lot of uh, animosity quite frankly of boulders getting all the stuff and why you know i want we certainly put money into this and we should get a share of it and we have projects that are just important as important but for whatever reason we were we we had some savvy folks in mostly Bo city of Boulder and the city of Denver. I'll be quite frank. The city of Denver got a big, big, big portion of it. The city of Boulder got a pretty big portion of it. And people didn't think that was fair. So they said, okay, let's divide up by counties and de delegate the shares of cash that way. 
and we di we divvy up the pot and all go for it. And then, so four years ago, we started doing this. And so we were just competing within Boulder County for a set amount of dollars. And Arapahoe County was just competing within Arapahoe County with all those jurisdictions for that set of dollars. So, and it goes on for the whole region. You know, there's, there's, um, I believe eight counties now that, that buy for this. So um, that's the way it's been changed up. And we appreciate that. That's, that's probably a good way to do it. And we, we've, we, we've taken what we can <laughs> as far as, you know, going after the pot of money, but we did apply last or four years ago, we did apply for uh, 119 project. Again, you can tell that's our focus really of the, of the county is that 119 project. And we threw that into the regional pot, that 20%, and we competed against all the other projects. And I do believe we finished first with that one. So 119 was kind of three projects put into one big regional project. And that's really how we got Kaufman Street busway under our belt. And that's why that project is moving forward because we won that money through that regional process. Um, Winning is not the best way to say that, but it's the best I've got for tonight. Um, but I did want to let you know that, um, so then we also competed at the, at the local level. So we competed within the, um, within the county and we did get some projects through there as well. So we, we were pretty successful and we had some, some good projects, but they were smaller, much smaller projects like, um, um, well, one of the projects we, I should also say that we're not just in Boulder County. We're also in the Southwest Weld County, which is just a little portion of Weld County kind of that goes out to I-25 and, and, and just beyond and only goes up to, um, um, basically Larimer County line. If you were to draw that across Weld County, you could, you could cut out that portion. And we were able to compete in that project in that pool as well. And, uh. There weren't a lot of people applying for things, but we were able to get the St. Vrain Valley Greenway or the St. Vrain Greenway um, as part of that project as well. So we're trying to finish that piece up. That's that last segment that goes into the St. Vrain uh, State Park. And uh, so that's underway right now, as well as Kaufman Street. So those are the kind of the two big ones that we got in those projects. Uh, so. We just want to let you know that this year it's going to be even a little bit more different because of this infusion of, of uh, federal dollars. And so they're asking for four, year, four calls of projects, which is a little confusing. Two of them are regional calls and then two of them are the more sub regional call or the county level call for projects. And so we plan to compete for those projects. And so on the back page of your packet, um, just wanted to point you to some of the projects that we think are critical for Longmont. And they're also something that's on our capital improvement program or capital improvement project list. So these are things that have already kind of seen the light of day through the transportation advisory board already. So just to go through these really quickly, we have um, state, you know, Colorado is the new designation. CO is the new designation for state highway. So I had to kind of put that in there because you'll see that a lot more often now, but the state highway 66, Basically, um, and this is this got this was incorrect as well. Sorry, from Hover to Main Street, it really is Pratt. I mean, we say Pratt because that's that's kind of where the project. If you take sixty six Highway sixty six west of Main Street, you'll see that it's very wide until about Pratt, and then it kind of narrows down back into two lanes in each direction or one lane in each direction, two lane total. So. We say to Pratt, but it really is to Main Street. So State Highway 66 from Holber to Main Street to widen that project. We're doing the design right now. So a lot of work has been done to get the design going. And the design includes things like um, what we call side paths, very wide trails basically that are more, more than just sidewalks on either side of that street so that we can have people walk and bicycle more safely on that street rather than just in the shoulders. We're also doing sound walls for the folks. Well, it looks like we're going to be doing sound walls for the folks who live south of that roadway. Because right now the fencing and those things aren't adequate to mitigate the noise that's expected from widening that from a 2 lane to a 4 lane total. Um, we're doing that for safety reasons uh, and congestion, but we've had the congestion out there for a long time. We've kind of lived with the congestion, but now it's more of a safety issue. So. 
um, the safety piece is kind of the big, big piece there. And again, we've already done a lot of the legwork on that. Um, County line road from 17th to state highway 66. Uh, we're going to go for a project that really tries to widen out the shoulders on that one. Does, doesn't really widen out the road much for capacity, but widens out shoulders again for bicycles and pedestrian movement to make it a little bit more convenient for folks who are especially on bicycles in that in that section of the corridor. At some point in the future, we will look at design and construction for that to be a four lane in the in the in the in the longer term future, but for right now, that's that's what we're looking out for that one. And then, kind of one that's been on our list for a long time is State Highway 119, also known as Ken Pratt Boulevard, in this section from Nelson to South Pratt Parkway. And so that's kind of the, that's really that, uh, you know, place where we really funnel down, and we have a lot of, uh, uh, you know, we have a lot of traffic that gets pushed into that little tiny area because you have so many roads that kind of come together and then people try to get through town on that. We had originally thought that that should be three lanes in each direction, but we've had some, um, we're seeing that that's not gonna be viable in kind of the next phase of projects. Uh, that kind of goes against what I said about State Highway 66, but State Highway 66 has been a project for almost you know 20 plus years and we've had it's got a lot of history that we can certainly go through if you'd like to hear it um maybe over a, a beverage at some time but um there's a lot of history as far as um deals that were made to kind of move dollars out of that project and into into other projects in the county over the years and so this one's been it has some historical piece to it the 66 project does but the 119 project is newer a little bit newer we've done some design work and we think that we, it's a very viable project if we make it business access and transit lanes. So that's basically a right turn lane that the buses can go straight in. We have a lot of those in town already, but this is one where we would build it an extra lane in each direction on the outside of the roadway, put in brand new uh, bike and walkway facilities on each side of the, of the roadway as well, and then add this as a business access transit lane or that right turn lane for businesses that the buses could keep going straight. So cars would be required to turn, buses could keep going, and that would be part of our bus rapid transit system as well. So that's something we're looking for. And really that only works, you know, at the larger sub-regional level if we go for those different kinds of lanes on that one. I'll just stop to see if you guys have any questions because I've been talking for a long time and I feel like uh, you might have some questions. So, yes, sir. Yeah, uh, thanks for all the information. So, uh, real quickly on the Hover Domain on uh, 66, um, you're saying just that area, that section is going to be go from two to four lanes, but it'll still go down to two lanes when it passes the Walmart, right? Because that's generally, I think it's two lanes through the rest of that. There's no way to. Yeah, correct. Extend. You're correct. We, we won't be working on any part, portion of that roadway yet east of Main Street. So this is all going to be west to Hover, and that's why we why we're co focusing on that. And and I can see your point of, you know, we've got traffic congestion in other areas all along that corridor, really. But what we see is that, and what we've seen for the last twenty plus years, ever since we kind of built Hover um, to connect all the way from sixty six down to down to Kim Pratt Boulevard, which has been a long time now. But we've seen a lot of people coming from the north who want to get to Boulder for jobs. And uh, what they're doing is they're coming down 287 or Main Street. Okay, they don't want to deal with downtown Longmont. So they're deviating to the west. And right now they're actually going to the west and then coming down Hover to get to the diagonal. And sometimes that's too congested. So some people are going all the way into Lyons <laughs> or almost to Lyons and taking 36 the Foothills Highway uh, down from Lyons to Boulder. So there's a lot of pressure in there. And what we're trying to do is is alleviate some of that. But, uh, you know, it's kind of the give and take. Just a real quick follow up. So the lights that come out of the Walmart development, uh, the, the intersection, the signals, I don't think the city has much control over those versus Maine. And that is probably CDOT, right? In other words, Maine and 
Um, I'm going to ask Tyler to please answer that question. Because that's a big backup because the lights are not timed from left-hand turn going north on 287. The Walmart light almost always turns red when an entire queue of cars is going through there. So it backs up main automatically during rush hour. At least I've noticed that. I drive that a lot. That, that is something that we can take a look at and make some adjustments. Those, um, Steve, you probably remember better than, than most anyone, but they're all on adaptive in that area. So we need to uh, um, make some adjustments to our coordination pattern on that one. The one that's not on adaptive is Erfurt um, east of Maine. And I notice a lot of the eastbound traffic often gets stopped there at Erfurt once that gets released, but I think we can definitely resolve some of those issues. Okay, yeah, the two Walmarts just seem like they're out of sync with the rest of the corridor, but yeah. I'll shut up now. <laughs> Any other questions? I'll just continue on then real quick here, just to kind of get through our list is we're working with uh, that Southwest Weld group and looking at doing a bigger path or a bigger trail system piece that takes into account Union Reservoir and the trail that's planned to, to loop around that, which isn't really a, much of a transportation, right? It's more of a recreation piece, but using a portion of that trail on the Southern piece to connect to uh, St. Frayne State Park on what's called the County Road 26. So we're, we're trying to get it out there. We're, we're working with the city of, or the town of Mead and the town of Firestone to also get connections in with what they're planning to do, which is to connect the high school it's out in Mead. Um, as you'll recall, there's some pretty unsafe corners that uh, that people take through there, and so and there really isn't a way to get to that high school from the south, especially by um, by bicycle or walking, without a lot of effort. So you really have to be on the road almost to make that work. So we're trying to get our connection that we want to go straight east to the state park and work that in with Mead's north south connection. And some connections that the uh, town of Firestone is working on as well. So that'll be through the St. Brain, or <laughs> excuse me, that'll be through the Southwest Weld sub um, sub region that we work on that one. And then, as many of you have probably seen, the north portions of Main Street don't get a lot of love <laughs> lately or recently. So what we're trying to do is look how can we better um, incorporate those portions where we see a lot of people walking across Main Street. And this does become an equity issue with a lot of low income uh, families that live up there and not being able to get to a signal very conveniently without deviating from your um, from your pedestrian path quite a ways to get to a signal. Uh, we, we always push people to the signals, but we realize sometimes that's not not reality. That's not the way people operate. They just need to get to the store. And so they just want to run across, um, you know, the four or five lane, six lane in some places, seven lane in some places. Um, set of lanes that make up Main Street. And so uh, the idea is to put in, uh, to do an underpass at Main and 21st and connect some of the planning that we have for the, for the road west of there, 21st Avenue west of there is planned to kind of be reduced to one lane in each direction and then bike lanes as the other piece of the lane. And so that would connect in well with our oligarchy trail that's on the east side of Main Street and you'll see some of that. There's a trail back behind some of those new apartments that were built. And so this is going to be a really good connector, I think, from the neighborhoods to get to Main Street from both east and west, get you underneath Main Street in a more safe way. So we're looking forward to that project and putting that out there. We think it has a really good chance. May I ask a question? About... Go yeah. ahead. Yes. Just... Sorry. But we still have a concern that they do cross north of 21st Street because the senior high rises there and I, I see people crossing all the time there and they're old, older people like me but they're older people and they don't move real fast and I'm afraid that you know they're just an accident about ready to happen and I'm not sure that they'd go down to 21st to cross under the underpass even if you do put it there. I'm again going to call on Mr. Stamey to uh, help me out with this one. Chair, Chair Stewart so um, you're absolutely right and that's one that I see Pretty much every time I drive through there is someone seems like someone's in the middle of the road right there, just south at the bus stop, just south of the okay. King Supers access. So a couple of things we're doing. I think we identified that as a need for um, that safety improvement through the Main Street corridor plan. 
I'm also working on a an application, the H SIP dollars highway safety improvement program, which would be federal dollars to, to fund a hawk type signal that would go at that location. Actually looking at a couple other locations for hawk and or flashing beacons, but that one in particular is one that I'm putting an application in for here pretty quick. Okay, thank you. I didn't know if it made a difference because it it technically is the state highway 287 and maybe they didn't want us slowing down there. One of, one of the great parts about the, the HSIP dollars on the state system is Longmont doesn't have to even provide the match. If we get it, CDOT provides the, the match okay. share. So that, that's a good bang for the buck if we get it. Great, thank you. So we work with CDOT. We identify these issues, and sometimes they identify the issues as well, and then we work together to come up with dollars to uh, to fund them, even if it's not in this necessarily in this TIP pro program, but there's some other dollars available too. So Tyler talked about that. And then um, talk a little bit about 21st Avenue from Hobart to Maine to Alpine, and we just want to start designing that. What I just talked about is taking the lane away um, in each direction west of Main Street and giving some of that um, unused capacity. Quite frankly, it's not being used a lot. And so we've we've checked the volumes, you know, year after year after year. There's not a lot of, I mean, I know there's a lot of pressure about and a lot of discussion about growth in Longmont, and I'm sure a council member, you hear this more than anyone, but uh, really in that area, there's no planned growth that's gonna affect that street necessarily. So there's some streets that, yeah, there is some growth coming to those streets. And I, I can't assure you, but I can tell you that the city staff works tirelessly to make sure that anything that's going to be developed and, and is planned to be developed, the roads next to it have the capacity to be able to take on that growth. And what we're seeing is, um, you know, some of the roads were overbuilt. Uh, one of those is 21st Avenue. And so we're gonna take it back down to maybe more realistic level for what it needs for traffic, which is one lane in each direction and give some of that capacity over to bikeways and to, and make it a little safer for walkers too, because they're close to that edge of roadway in some cases. So by putting the, the bikeway, we're giving some more buffer to the walkers as well. So a couple of things going on with that project. And again, that needs to go through design before it goes through construction. So we'll need to ask for those design dollars. So we're building exactly what we need to um, and being very prudent with the, with the taxpayers dollars when we do that. The next one is Hover Street, um, Longs Peak Avenue down to Allen, which is um, a short stretch. And I'm, we're still kind of wondering if we, we need to kind of pair this in maybe with some other missing sidewalks. But that's that missing sidewalk that's on Hover. We probably are talking about not just this sidewalk, but carrying it all the way down to the Home Depot on that west side because there's just no, no sidewalk except for that short little piece that's from the Greenway north to Allen. And then there's that gap and we have that new project that was just built uh, uh, just south of 9th there. So there's there's some gaps in the sidewalk we need to look at. But these are all bigger streets, bigger arterials. So we think that we have some good cases to put out that these are arterial sidewalks or what we call side paths um, to, to build. And, we, and those do cost a lot of money when you start adding them up. So we're gonna ask for some money for those. And Ken Pratt Boulevard, um, Somewhere between Nelson and South Pratt Parkway again uh, goes back to the idea that we had uh, adding those bat lanes, but we've got some pressure to find a place for a good underpass. So we'd like to do some design work to figure out if is there a good place to put an underpass in that segment of Ken Pratt Boulevard so we can get people safely who live south of Ken Pratt Boulevard to the shopping and, and, the, and the jobs that are north of Ken Pratt Boulevard. So those are some things we're looking at uh, right now. And then lastly, um, I threw this on there because I like transit. Um, <laughs> and we've always been talking about a circulator route in town. So what better place to kind of put this in than a transportation improvement program project that is looking at new opportunities for some transit. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of shop this around a little bit and see if there's anybody who would be willing to help provide this like via mobility services. Uh, they, they have been very, responsive to our request to help with transit in the city. And they they really were the ones who helped develop the hop um, shuttle in Boulder. When it first started, they were the they were kind of the ones who provided the service and now that's been taken over by RTD. So RTD saw the benefit in those things. So we'd like to kind of replicate that and see if we can't get some something like that going in Longmont. So 
That's a lot to talk about, a lot of projects. Um, I'd like to hear if you have anything more to add or if there's something that we're, I mean, there's gonna be lots of small projects on smaller streets, I understand that, but we're, we have to compete countywide. So do you have anything that you can think of that maybe countywide we've, or that we compete on a countywide level that we're, we may wanna think about? Um, yes, ma'am. Diane. Uh, so, Phil, I have a question. If you could explain the difference between VIA and RTD. Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, yeah. VIA, VIA isn't, well, they're both nonprofits, but VIA is more local. It's more of a Boulder County based nonprofit transit service. It really caters to uh, people with disabilities and people who are older. So, it's, it's really for people who can't drive anymore. And what they've done is they've uh, they've kind of catered the program so it's it's open to everyone still, but it really is working to move people who can't move themselves as easily or don't own cars or don't have access to vehicles, those kind of things. People who need to get to uh, medical appointments, people who need to get to shopping um, and need to do their shopping and don't have the ability to get to some of the shopping centers in our town. Um, but the medical appointments is probably the big one. And, and so and again, it's, it's they, a door to door type service. Yeah, sorry, it's a it's, a, it's actually a called a it's called called a door through door service for uh, people who are older and people with disabilities. But they'll provide the curb to curb service for other people who have um, have more ability to 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 be mobile. Okay, thank you. I also have a question about the twenty first. Um, 21st Avenue, you say it's overbuilt in places. Where, uh, specifically, where do you think it's overbuilt? Well, I'm just, uh, I guess I'm just basing that on volumes. And we've, you know, we really kind of shoehorned four lanes of, four lanes of, uh, of roadway into that. Uh, and, and, you know, when you drive it, it's pretty, you're pretty tight on one side to the curb. And on the other side, you're pretty tight to the curb. And there's not much wiggle room for the cars. And in our in our kind of research for that of that facility, we've seen it kind of the traffic grew and grew and grew in the 70s, and then kind of plateaued off later, uh, probably in the early 90s, middle 90s, and so we just saw a plateau effect. And we said, well, that those number of vehicles don't really justify a four lane road all day every day, and so there might be some times we did the same thing on um, on Francis Street where we had a four lane facility up there and it just wasn't being used to the full extent of the four of the four lanes. And so we changed it to a center turn lane, uh, one travel lane in each direction and then bike lanes. And so we're trying to take that same model. And we really, I think the only, we got one call that said, um, and maybe Tyler remembers more of the history, but um, we had one call that said, great job, you did a great job. And I think we had one other call that just said, um, what are these bike lanes doing here or some, something to that effect, but nobody would ever complained about, oh my gosh, there's so much more traffic. We can't get through, you know, you've really messed up the road. Nobody really noticed and thought most everything was better than it was worse. So. Yeah, Phil, I think we've had a handful of success, successes on streets of that similar type of conversion. I think of, um, sunset between Pike road and Kansas, our next step would be taking that up through Ken Pratt, but that's one section where we definitely had a four lane road. There was some concern about taking capacity away, but at the time we did that, I think by and large, it's been a success. I've not heard any, you know, maybe a handful of complaints right out of the out of the gate when we first did the change, but it's been relatively successful. And then right, the last year we did Ninth Avenue, um, more or less between Hober and Kaufman was another section we did a similar treatment on portions of, and I think by and large, it's been a, a relatively successful project. So that's kind of the, when we talk about re repurposing capacity on 21st Avenue, that's really what we're looking to do. And we don't do this without, um, you know, a lot of research and a lot of thought. We don't, we don't do this in kind of a haphazard manner. We make sure that we are really checking these different roadways out first and really checking to see where the, if they have the capacity and, and what time of day do they get busy and those kind of things? So, um, 
it's just a it's we're kind of on a tightrope a little bit here, but we, we we think we've done a pretty good job so far to identify those roads that what it was called is it's called a roadway road diet or complete streets. So complete if you look up any of those terms on the internet, you'll see that there's a lot of desire these days to take that extra capacity, and not just have cars going much faster than the speed limit on with the excess capacity, but we kind of ratchet down the capacity just enough so the cars can make it through, but they're not going high speed. And we've really noticed that on 9th Avenue, quite frankly, lately is the places where we've, um, where we took out a lane in each direction, the traffic moves much more calmly, I guess. And people like the ideas that they can bicycle and walk next to this roadway that used to be fairly, fairly high speed. I mean, it, you can set your speed limits at whatever you want. People will basically go the speed that they think is appropriate. You know, just in their mind, they feel comfortable, so they go that they go speed, they go faster maybe than they should, and we just don't have the people to to enforce. So big long explanation, but that's what we're out, we're looking at for the city. And so um, you're talking about the area between um, west of Maine on 21st as it goes to Hover. That's all four lane in there, and, and you're, you're looking at that will actually. Um, reduce speed on those areas, but if you go east of Maine on 21st, uh, it's mostly um, two lane, one each way. Yep. And past the railroad tracks, it widens a bit, so there is room for a bike lane and parking. But I hear a lot of complaints there about parking on 21st because um, the traffic moves swiftly, and there's it's close, and so people worry about their mirrors. I guess there have been a lot of clippings along there. And and there are homes that face 21st that um, that's the only parking they have in front of their home. So I'm just I'm just curious um, if that's going to be a problem. Um, and and I know it's more commercial west of Maine, but I'm just wondering if that's going to be a problem for the people that live on say the south side of 21st there. Yeah, about five years ago we did what's called the enhanced multi-use corridor plan. It's not a great name. I don't like it, but. We, we shorten it down to EMUC because that's what we do in transportation, right? We have an acronym for everything. So the enhanced multi-use corridor plan we took a look at 21st Avenue for the whole stretch. And so we have a planning document that kind of starts to lead us and was, you know, and this was obviously adopted by council. So it's, it's part of the policy of the city. And this document leads us to uh, improvements in that area that really help pedestrians and, uh, and bicyclists while trying to preserve as much parking as possible, but safely and not in a, you know, like you said, there, there's some issues with some of that street. So the, the, the piece east of Main Street on 21st Avenue, I would say is really, is really about doing a higher level design work. We kind of know what we need to do west of Main. So that design is gonna be pretty quick, I would imagine. And then we go out to the public and get public input on that. But the design efforts east of Main are gonna be a little bit more intense and we're really gonna have to do some more outreach to make sure when we're impacting parking, we're doing it in a in a respective manner or a respectful manner. Well, um, if I can throw it out, there's been some suggestion that we we take that bike lane and actually maybe put a and I don't know what it's called, but maybe a little bit of an island where people park on the other side of a curb, if you will. Um, just so there's that gap between the the you know, the tra the traffic that's shooting by and the people that are parked. And then just less chance to clip the cars that are there. And, and I, I don't know if there's enough space there. It seems like maybe there might be now enough space. Um, and then if I can just impose one more question, you were saying about um, four lanes on highway 66 and you wanted to add in room for bike paths and walk paths. And I wondered about the bike path, if it would actually be on highway 66 or it would be a separate path uh, a separate cemented path, like the pedestrian path. Right. The, 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 the vision at this point is that it would be 1 path on each side. That would be wide enough uh, to accommodate bicycles and pedestrians at the same time. Okay. And so what do you think about the, um, 21st Avenue idea of putting some little barrier between the parking, you know, sort of like a pull through parking situation. Well, that, that's really why we go out for public outreach on these projects is, is sometimes our consulting firm that we hire, you know, we have to go through that whole process of hiring consultants and they'll come up with basically three, three options or four options. 
and we take those out to the public then and we kind of see which one they can which one is most palatable which one offers the best you know bang for its buck we'll say but also keeps people we want to make sure that they are getting what they need from the system as well we don't want to take things away especially parking has been a big, big issue in the city we realize that so what we're trying to do is make sure we're working with them to make sure they get what they need from the project but we also get the safety that we need uh, as as citywide you know citywide safety basically is what we're going for uh, for bicycles pedestrians and people driving cars and okay so west of main street on the south side there are homes there that just haven't had parking in front of their homes and they do have a challenge getting out onto 21st do you think that'll improve their um availability out of their driveways and then will they also have a little parking in front of their homes well we've talked about how we could design this to be to work with them i know they do have driveways that go into garages so there's a lot of driveways to contend with in that section of 21st mm -hmm. so there is parking technically behind the behind the garage but that's not ideal right when you're visiting so then you have to back into 21st um what's kind of nice about that is that yeah we could we could work with our whoever's going to be doing our design on that project and make sure in that section we maybe provide a little bit of space for people to have a safe maneuver and not impact the bicycles that are going to be there too so but there is a really wide sidewalk on that side too so we've got a couple things in play but it's all going to be you know kind of the fine tuning the design and making sure we're making not making but we're keeping people happy um, and, and making sure that our design doesn't negatively impact people and their quality of life. So we'll be, we'll be working through that. I know when I bicycle on that side of the street on 21st that I tend to use the sidewalk. It is wider, as you say. And I feel that it's easier for people backing to see the pedestrians and bicyclists on the sidewalk. Also, there isn't room right currently in the street to bicycle. But I was wondering if you move the bicycle lane into the street, if it might be a little more dangerous um, for those who are backing out, you know, in terms of hitting a, a cyclist. So I'm, I'm glad you're thinking about it. All right, thank you. And I'll pass the baton to whoever else has a question. Anyone else? David. Yes, Phil, is it accurate to say that this funding process is set up to reward um, cities and counties that can demonstrate that their vmt is increasing we have we have argued that case <laughs> it makes us especially in from the boulder county perspective where we're trying to decrease vmt mm -hmm. uh, it makes us pretty uh makes us a little wily and a little set when we have to compete against those who are getting rewarded you're exactly right for for increasing their vehicle miles of travel um, and so we have had those conversations at Dr. Cog, and uh, this is kind of where we're at because the the counties that really, you know, Boulder County and maybe Denver, maybe Broomfield County are the three kind of outliers, and the rest of the counties are really excited about getting more dollars for their vehicle miles traveled. But that being said, a lot of these dollars are contingent on how you. Uh, control greenhouse gases, how you accelerate uh, or increase people on alternative modes and active modes. So a lot of the dollars, especially in this first and second call, are really what, what's called multimodal dollars. And so you're going to have to come up with some really good multimodal projects to get that, that money. So it'll be interesting to see. It kind of forces those other counties who have a bigger pot of money to look at their alternative mode plans and really make sure they're getting dollars for those facilities now three and four will be a little bit more traditional calls three and four will be a little bit more traditional where they come out of more of the highway dollars but they're still going to have to prove that they don't increase greenhouse gases which again vmt is a great measure of if you have more vmt you typically have more greenhouse gas production so it's gonna be an interesting little game that's going to get played here as far as the politics involved. Yes, what occurred to me is that a lot of the projects for Longmont that you've uh, presented to us this, this evening by 
uh, encouraging walking and bicycling and possibly even transit shuttle riding, they have real potential to reduce VMT. So if, if they're implemented, it seems like unless the process has changed, it would hurt Longmont's chances in the future of getting additional dollars for projects like that. Right, and again, we're following the policy of our city council is to lower the greenhouse gases and uh, really work on these alternative modes. And electric, we're working on electrification of, of you know, having EV chargers, electric vehicle chargers in more public uh, parking lots. And so a lot of different things going into that, but first and foremost on my mind is um, how do we make alternative modes, modes more attractive to people so they don't need to drive everywhere in Longmont? or outside of Long Island. Is there any indication that um, the TIP criteria will be changed to encourage VMT reduction? Not in the near term, but possibly in the longer term, yes. Council member Yarborough. Um, as you all were speaking, and I know you're trying, I, I mean, I'm new to this, so you all know that, but, um, this all sounds like an equity issue to me, you know, and, you know, Boulder County is talking about trying to be more equitable in, in every aspect of every division, every department, um, our transportation, it, we need to make sure we have our safety is equitable. We need to make sure. I mean, all, everything that you're talking about are equity issues um, from our seniors who have to walk across the street and um, from widening our bikers and walkers. I mean, that's a safety issue. Um, so, I mean, why can't we, and maybe you all have already brought it up, but I would definitely think that it makes sense to talk about the equity part of transportation, our lower income areas, um, safety issues for people who do, um, who are lowering the, um, the, our footprint, right? And so, I mean, we talk about sustainability. And so I think we could maybe have some type of equity thing with it and maybe that way it can trigger and people say, oh, look at Longmont. They're looking at it from an equitable lens. Um, so I don't know when you were just going through all of these calls, I just calls of projects. I just really believe all of this is about equity and even the highway 66 west of Maine, all of that to me um, and people running across the street. I mean, who wants to walk with a stroller if you're taking your kids to the, you know, uh, all the way down <laughs> to the light when, you know what I'm saying? All of those things. And that's a safety issue as well, too. Um, I don't know, maybe there's a thing that the Longmont can have. And I just, for me, everything that you talked about was equity. So that's the thought. Well, I, I appreciate you recognizing that because that is kind of what sits behind all of these projects is uh, and we look through it through, we say an equity, equity lens, but we really are trying to broaden out where the projects go and not be as, you know, before maybe, Downtown got a lot of, um, you know, different different grants, and it was pretty easy to get those grants for downtown. Well, now we're trying to go uh, with this one. We're really trying to get kind of north and south of downtown and east and west of downtown, and try to, uh, you know, put those resources where they're needed, and not, not just where a project looks good or. Or, 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 you know, we can do different kinds of projects. We're trying to do projects that, um, again, we're always using that equity land, equity lens to be able to see, and it's been a big piece that's on our on our on our mind when we look at these projects is making sure we're thinking about equity when we're looking at the projects, and uh, we we are reminded of that at every level. So I appreciate that. Yeah, and, and, and also with VIA, you know, when I think about you all collaborating and partnering with VIA, that's very good. And um, I mean, we we are growing. We are about to, we're going to grow. It's, it's inevitable. So how can we continue on? Think, me, myself, I think about the UC Health, the hospital, 
there's no transportation that goes out there. And those workers are essential workers. So are we we're gonna use via like the hop from Boulder? Um, I mean, until we can get something. I mean, we need to start thinking ahead of the game. Um, because we know that that side of Kim Pratt or 119 is about to blow up. And so we know that. How are we going to be prepared? Uh, what modes of transportation are we gonna have to prepare us for that? We have to start thinking about that now. And I know we got these small projects and they're really small, big equitable projects, but then here we are again, we expecting this influx of people to move here. We're building all these apartments Okay, and then we don't want them to drive. That doesn't make any sense. They can't hop on a bus. There are no bike lanes on 119. You know what I'm saying? So we, we I mean, I know we have the trail, so I just want us to be thinking about that as well. Liz. I want to um, add to and thank uh, Council Member Yarbrough. One of the, she mentioned something and I just want to put it on the record. Longmont lacks public transportation opportunities for shift workers. Mm -hmm. It's a huge problem. And VIA can't get people to work on a regular, reliable basis. They can get you to a doctor's appointment once a week or something. But if you need to go every day and you need to go later at night, say you're working the one to nine or something, we don't have, that's, that's something huge that is missing from the transportation aspect in Longmont. Thanks. Diane. Uh, thank you, Council Member uh, Yarborough. Uh, I want to piggyback on that because I agree with you that uh, safety has a lot to do with your economic standing. Uh, I don't know if you all knew Lawrence Schaefer, who was on the transportation board in Colorado Springs. Um, he was uh, he was a good member of that board because he worked in a parking garage. He was a pedestrian or bicyclist. He did not have a vehicle. Uh, he was very instrumental in sort of enlightening how the bus service was working down there. And I don't know if you all are aware, but he was killed in a pedestrian automobile accident around Christmas. And uh, he was crossing to go get breakfast early in the morning and was hit by a, a motorist. Okay. Probably the son was maybe behind him. And, and it was a young driver and it, it kind of uh, ruined both lives there. He was killed and, and, uh, and she was devastated, you know. So when we create these solutions, we're solving a, a problem of transportation for people who don't have other choices, as Council Member Yarbrough mentioned. And also, uh, we're protecting the motorist as well because it can be devastating for them, you know, to, to be involved in a fatal accident. So, um, so thank you, um, Phil, for all your work with um, all this consideration on these projects. And I agree that we, we need to be pretty careful how we implement them. And I, I do see that on um, Weld County Road, uh, that's highlighted also as one of your projects. And that's, that is a direction that people from the north end of town could get down to UC Health. But, but Council Member Yarbrough is correct. Now on 119, how do they get to it from, you know, coming from central, um, part of town in Longmont, so. I just wanted to let you know that I just put in a chat, <clears throat> excuse me, um, a connection to RTD's latest endeavor to figure out what we want as different communities within the RTD for the bus system. And this is kind of a shorter term look, it's like a five year plan. And you'll see there's a bus that's planned for um, basically from downtown to the UC Health and the Walmart and um, uh, and, and the other businesses and, and households down there. But it's it was one of those things we identified when Walmart first kind of came out of the ground is you're gonna have a lot of people who need to work here. RTD start thinking about this. Well, they started thinking about it. Then we saw UC Health come to our door, you know, come to us with their proposal and we said, okay, RTD, there's some more people that are going to be out in this location. You need to start providing bus service. And unfortunately, it doesn't happen overnight with RTD. It doesn't happen overnight with the city, quite frankly. But talk about bureaucracies, I'm sure we could compare and contrast bureaucracies. But um, 
it's been really tough with them. And I would, I would encourage you, this is a really clunky site, but I'd encourage you to go to this site and make comments about where things could be improved, um, what kind of things we need to really get transit in the city to work. Because we don't have, a, we, we put resources into the ride free bus system and I've talked to this group a number of times about that. And we'll probably talk again about it in, in the near future, especially with RTD coming next month. So RTD will be coming next month to give their annual kind of, um, you know, a, annual report on kind of the state of the bus system in, in Longmont, Colorado. And so I, I really hope you can all make it. And I hope you have lots of great questions for RTD about um, you know, their services in, in our city. But the first thing they're going to come back to you is we don't have money, right? So you're going to hear about resources. You're going to hear all these things. Uh, we need to be creative in the way we kind of work our way around those comments because it's always going to be a money issue with RTD and with the city, quite frankly. But um, with RTD, it's it's why can't you provide more or what could the city do, you know, to maybe change the way we allocate resources for the right free program if they were to come up with a more equitable fair box system, you know, that worked for everybody, could we then shift our resources that we're paying to buy up that fair box? Could they move those in? Could we move that into like, we'll pay you for more service than along this, along this major route where we see a lot of people taking the bus. And we think that if we increase the service levels, more people would be attracted to that bus as well. And kind of work in partnership. We've been trying that for a number of years, um, and you can kind of see where that's where that's gotten us all. But um, I think we're all saying the same thing. So I'll stop. Any other questions of Phil? Yes, Diane. Phil, what is the name of the site where you would like us to put our our questions in? I'm going to put it in the chat. There's a little link in the chat. And if, oh, okay. if that doesn't work for you, I can send the link out to everybody. Um, it's through the, it's through a group called um, FHU, which is an engineering group that's doing the consultant work for RTD. But it's basically a mapping program where you kind of have to take your comment and plop it on the map and then put your comment in there. It's a little, like I said, it's very clunky. It's not as user friendly as we had hoped it would be. Uh, we didn't really get to design it, but we've been kind of reacting to RTDs. You know, here, here's this way of commenting. So we've made a number of comments. The 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 comment period was supposed to end February 9th. We got them to extend it to March 9th. So please uh, send people there. Send people out there if you know of folks who would want to have comments about the bus system in Longmont. It would be great to. Really fill up the long map portion of that map with lots of little dots that say, "Here's where an improvement could be made. Here's something you're doing well, RTD. Here's something where you're not." So, I mean, we can give them good, good and bad uh, feedback, I guess, or feedback that's both positive and negative. Would you please send that in to us? That yeah, that, okay, that. I will. Great, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, Phil, I guess you get to talk to us about the um, transportation. Um. Well, we're going to try something new. This has not been tried with this group before. So yeah. this is kind of my fault. And Tyler and Jim and Ben can give me a hard time for how this turns out. But I I really think, uh, and, and other, other cities have been doing this, is with these bills that are released by the legislature, you know, they kind of go out. I think it's important for the TAB to maybe look at these, especially when they have such a huge impact to the city. Um, some of them are just about funding and, and maybe you don't really care too much about those. Maybe you do, and maybe we should bring the funding ones. Maybe we should bring everything that's transportation related back to this group. I don't know if we'd have time um, through the legislative session, which usually goes through what, July or June. So, but there is one out there that a lot of us have comments on and um, and I just wanted to kind of let you know, it's more of a, one of the more controversial bills this year, and it's really about the statewide regulation of controlled intersections. So what it's about is, um, it goes back to a rule that's called the Idaho stop law. Um, and it really talks more about the idea that, uh, 
you can go up to a stop sign as a bicyclist. And right now you're supposed to come to a complete stop, put your foot down to show that you've stopped and then you can go on your way. Uh, regardless of where the stop sign is and, and. The first thing on my mind is, you know, California stop. Um, with cars, you know, cars kind of roll through, right? And don't really come to a complete stop at stop signs. So this is kind of the same idea, but for and making it legal for bicyclists to do the same. There's a lot of stipulation to it. And I think I sent a link, but I'm not sure if everybody was able to download the rules. But the basic idea of the rule is as you approach a stop sign, um, and in our minds, this is a little fast, you know, it says after slowing to a reasonable speed of 15 miles per hour or less, could be 10 miles, could be 20 miles per hour, depending on what the jurisdiction decides, which in my mind, 20 miles is not, 20 miles per hour is not less than 15 miles per hour. So I'm not sure of the wording there, but anyway, um, after slowing to a reasonable speed of 15 miles per hour um, and yielding the right of way to any traffic or pedestrian in the approaching intersection, Continue through the intersection, intersection without stopping. And there's a very similar rule for stop lights as well for signals. When approaching an illuminated red traffic control signal, the person must first stop at the intersection and yield to all other traffic and pedestrians, and then, when safe to do so, may proceed straight or make a right turn through the intersection, which I think is legal anyway. If you stop, you can turn. You can usually turn right on red, um, but you can't make a left turn, which makes sense as well. We want you to hold and wait for the green light to turn left, but it's giving permission for people to go straight through a, a red signal in in, uh, in these stop controlled intersections. If it's safe to do so, if there's nobody coming in either direction. And I think what this is trying to address is many times um, with the old magnetic loop systems that were in the inside a roadway, and Tyler knows a thousand times more than I do about this, but the loop, there's loops within the road, roadway, which are magnetic, loops and your car triggers them pretty easily and says, okay, there's a car waiting here. Um, now the other signals can go for a while, but they need to turn red at some point and let me go through as a as the car. Bikes have a hard time triggering these things because you really have to hit a certain point on those loops. If you're in between, if you're in the middle of a loop, I mean think of the loop as about you know eight feet wide or eight foot in diameter. And if you're a bicyclist in the middle of that None of that is catching the metal on your bicycle, and there's not very much metal on a bicycle. But what Tyler has done really well in this city, and uh, other cities have done this as well, is started to incorporate camera technology rather than using the loops. They use kind of infrared cameras, and and if you ever want to know more about it, Tyler's your man. But uh, they they can see that the car is sitting there. They can see if a bicyclist is 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 in the you know in the area that they've defined for triggering the signal. So. We only have a few loop systems left in town. And so we're really thinking that, you know, cameras are really working well to, um, to make sure that a, a bicyclist is seen. Now the pedestrian still has to do their thing at the signal where they have to push the button. And it's kind of called the beg button at this point where you have to beg for the, for the signal to change for you. And you have to push that button. And that's unfortunate. Tyler's also worked at downtown and in other places around well, there's lots of pedestrians up north and typically on Main Street where um, you don't have to push the button to get the walk signal. You'll get a walk signal regardless. So that's been really nice in some of these more higher pedestrian areas. And they're starting to work on technology that can kind of figure out if a pedestrian's standing on the corner. Um, it doesn't really say which way they're going to go. So that's the hard part of that one. Uh, pedestrian still needs to in signal where they're going to go. But we wanted to Put this rule in front of you, this this proposed bill, and get you to just maybe tell us: is is this something that you want to see? Um, do you do you feel like this is the right way to move forward, or do you feel like this law might be a little, uh, you know, have some other issues with it? We just kind of wanted to get your sense, and maybe in future ones, if you think this is a good idea, we'll come back and get your action item to give council some idea of what where this board stands on some of these items in the future steve yeah so um i, I kind of know this this area a little bit better uh from idaho stop a uh, personal friend of mine was an attorney in idaho that actually helped pass this this law but i guess the problem with it as a whole as it's 
kind of done is, is that the perception from the motorist side um, is just, it's always been very kind of a hot button kind of issue, if you will. And I believe, and I could be wrong, there's a couple of the states that tried to pass it and they weren't successful. And I can't remember what the states are. So in other words, I think Colorado might be wading into one of those hot button issues in general. And so the perception of what it's there for and studies have been done, and Tyler, Phil, you, you may have those, um, that actually show it's, it's actually safer than when you have it the other way, right? And, and so that's the big thing. So when we talk about safety, you know, and, and that really should be the main reason why we have stop signs and stop lights and, and, and what have you. Um, the Idaho stop, as it's called, is generally actually safer for, for almost all cyclists in all situations. Uh, yeah, you'll have some knuckleheads, but we have knuckleheads driving cars too, right? So. Um, the point is, is that this is actually a safety issue and it gets uh, perceived as something else like entitlement and or, you know, um, unfair to the motorist, if you will, even though it's done when usually there's no cars there. So yeah, that's just my, my, my two cents on that. If I may, Chair, um, offer just a little bit more information. And Ben Ortiz is really the expert on this. So um, if, we, if we need, we'll have Ben chime in here and, uh, and give you some background. But the, the rule is really right now, and this is kind of the failing of the rule, is that um, I think it was last legislative session or the one before where it was passed statewide that you could allow the, it's called safety stop, it's called Idaho stop. So you can allow the safety stop rule to um, apply as the cities wanted it to. So now, now in Colorado, you have a bunch of cities that have said, oh, okay, it's okay to do the Idaho stop or the, safety stop at some of our um, different stop signs in town. But one of the towns was Thornton. And if you know Thornton at all, you know that it's just surrounded by a bunch of other different jurisdictions. So people don't know, really. I mean, only us, you know, uh, you know, us uh, bureaucrats know where the actual edges of the cities usually are in those in those places, what what road and all that. But most people just think I'm driving on a street or I'm riding on a street on my bicycle and I live in Thornton and I'm going to, I don't have to stop at all these stop signs. Well, then you get into Westminster, which is right next door. Don't realize you've crossed the boundary and you're going through a stop sign and you get, you get pulled over um, if that happens, but you get pulled over and they'll say, well, you weren't following our laws. Well, okay. Now the law is different in each city. And that's really what we're trying to avoid here is, some of that with this with this statewide law, but again, it gets into the perception of bicyclists already kind of have a bad rap, as you mentioned. Um, you know, bicyclists don't like the perception that bicycles have some kind of, you know, they get they get some kind of benefit because they're on a bike, they get to ride on by on sidewalks, and they get to ride on the street, they get to cross at weird places that don't make sense to motorists. And so there's already this perception that bicyclists are getting away with something. So that's part of this as well we're trying to talk about. Council member Yarborough. I think um, when, if you bring this to council, I know what I would ask is, how are you going to communicate with uh, the community members? That is key number one. Like, just to even thought about the thought about it. Um, I mean, education, 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 like you have to let them know um, because what's going to happen is a motorist may end up hitting someone or hurting someone with that, of course, not with it, you know, not being intentional, but they will say, I didn't know. I didn't know nothing about, you know, the safety stop. I didn't know that that existed. So, I mean, even if that we did want to do something like that, we have to educate the community about it first. I mean, you have people who, who still really don't respect bikers, you know, cyclists out here. So um, whenever we try to do something like that, we have to make sure we provide education and maybe showing that other cities where it has, you know, it has worked and it's very successful, um, the benefits, for both the motorist and the cyclist, if there are any, um, because people like to feel like that they're getting getting something out of it too, and they're benefiting as well, not just the cyclist. Um, so, I mean, that's my two cents of it uh, about it. I, 
I don't have a problem with it, but I do think that it's very important that we educate those motorists before we even put something in place like that, that people have that understand what the, what does this mean moving forward, right? And just to be clear, the city staff is not promoting this as as a change at this time. Um, but we just wanted to get your feedback as you know, is this a good law? Is this a what what are the benefits? What are the what are the drawbacks? How do you how do you react as a board to if we were to say take a position on this, what what would the board position be? Again, this is just kind of a we're we're just kind of playing with this right now. We're not, it's not an action item, but it could be, if you guys wanted to make it a, a, an action item, we could do that at the next, at the next one. If it's not already gone through, that's the problem with these things too, is they're very quick. This one's taking a little bit longer because it's controversial, but uh, they're typically very quick through the, through the house and the, and the Senate, the state Senate. So um, we just wanted to get this in front of you and kind of get your feedback. David. Yes, I, I can see the advantage of doing this uh, statewide if it's going to be done for the reasons that Phil explained. To have uh, consistency for someone who unknowingly goes through a municipal boundary. But I was surprised that the legislature used uh, safety and reducing the number of collisions as their rationale for proposing this. You know, I think it clearly the benefit of this is to the energy expenditure of bicyclists who really don't want to lose momentum. So anytime they can slow down and proceed through an intersection rather than come to a complete stop, especially if there's a hill involved, uh, that's a big advantage to them, but I can see at least one situation where I think it it reduces safety at the intersection. So think about a four way stop mm -hmm. with a cyclist and a motorist approaching at right angles to each other, and the motorist is to the right of the cyclist. So the motorist is accustomed to not stopping at stop signs to turn right. Mm -hmm. So just rolls on through, makes the right turn. <clears throat> the cyclist is assuming that the motorist will stop at the stop sign and therefore intends to go straight through without stopping. So it ends up with the motor vehicle pulling out in front of the cyclist which could result in a collision. I just want to point out that that's, I'm sorry, but that's not accurate. So the law states in Idaho, it was not, cyclists can just blow through a stop sign, even if there's cars present. You have to slow down and stop if there's cars there. The idea is, is that if it's an unattended intersection, with a stoplight, you have to stop completely. It's not about momentum for the cyclist. It's actually safer for a cyclist not to have to stop than to stop all cyclists. Consider that. Consider a child riding a bike, stopping, or somebody who who who, who might have some sort of a disability, whether it's vision or, or, or otherwise. So the point is, is that going very slowly through an intersection, when it's clear, is the whole intent of that law. It's not about blowing through when there's a car there. That's that's breaking the law. And and so that's, you know, if you read the original language that that kind of was the precursor to this and Phil's right, it's like the the municipalities kind of did it happenstance and they want to make this a state law and try to make it, I think, as digestible as possible so everybody could sign off on it is what it sounds like to me. But it's a safety issue and uh, Councilperson Yarborough is exactly right that we're not communicating the benefits of this particular thing is about safety. Um, that's the most important function of it. It's not about the advantage of one person to get ahead of the other, like, you know, slowing down because you don't want to slow down. So I'm just saying that, that the law states that if you hit there and a, you're a cyclist and there's a car there, you got to stop. You're, you, you can't just blow through the stop sign. <clears throat> I guess I'm thinking more about what happens out on the roads rather than 
what's written in the legislation. Well, absolutely. No, you're absolutely right. And I think that's where the education is key. Yes, Diane. I guess I'm not as clear, um, Steve, as to why um, rolling through a stop is safer for a cyclist. Um, you can explain that to me further. I tend to agree more with David McInerney is that um, in my, in our last session, I talked about, if you look in the notes, it's on page four, I talked about an incident that I had, and it's almost exactly what David described mm -hmm. in that um, a motorist was coming southbound. Oh, I think it was on Gay Street from 21st, and there's a stop sign there as you approach the northbound lanes in on 21st. And I was on the south side of 21st heading west, okay? And I stopped and looked at him, and I knew he had another stop sign there before he entered the, um, the south two lanes, okay? And I advanced into the road, and he didn't stop very long at that stop sign and he also did not look left and see me and he if I had rolled through that even at you know 15 miles an hour not going full throttle think, expecting him to stop again I would have been squashed because um, I stopped just before the line and he was shocked to see me there in the middle of, of the road and there wasn't anybody coming northbound so um, I've got to say that when it comes to a pedestrian or a bicyclist versus an autom automobile the cyclist and the pedestrian is always at a disadvantage because we don't accelerate to the degree that other cars do and 15 miles an hour is just going to put you in a more precarious position even though in in that situation i felt confident he was going to stop he did not so for for my safety i feel that the idaho stop or the full stop is a safer alternative but steve you could explain to me why why you think it's safer to continue to roll through well, again, you, you don't roll through a occupied stop sign. So in, in effect, number one, a pedestrian has a right of way at all times at a crosswalk at a stop sign. So a pedestrian should have. So the motorist is breaking the law. Now, I think David nailed it when he said that we know in practice out in the real world, motorists aren't necessarily going to follow the laws of the rules. We know that from rolling red, red, um, um, rolling uh, stop signs and what have you. Um, but I do know I could dig it up. There have been some studies that have been done on this because um, Oklahoma, California, Idaho, there's about, I don't know, Ben, you might know how many states have passed this law. There's been a numerous studies that have been done on it, um, talking about the, the safety factors as well as the safety advantages to it. Um, so I'm partly speaking from personal experience as well as I know that there's studies that, that are involved with that. Um, but, in, but in almost all cases of this law, when it's an occupied intersection, meaning two vehicles, a bike and a, and a car, you know, gets there at the same time, the cyclist doesn't just blow through the sign. They, they have to stop. They, they have to, it's about yielding as well. Um, so again, I, I think it re remains to be edu education that's going to help maybe educate drivers as well as cyclists. Don't get me wrong. Again, there's knuckleheads out there that would blow through a stop sign and they need to be also counseled on the law and what it really means. But um, I, I know I'm not completely answering your question, and I can dig up those studies and send them to the group if everybody wants to read them. Yeah, uh, Steve, if if this comes up before our board again, and you have the time, maybe you could point us towards some studies that actually show uh, a causal link between the Idaho stop law and a reduction in bike vehicle collisions. I've read about a number of studies, safety studies that were done after laws were passed and they didn't show any increase, but they didn't prove that the reason for that was the, uh, the passage of a, a law like the Idaho stop. Thank you. Diane? So Steve, I'm I'm still not sure why a roll through is safer. Um, and in, in my particular example, um, the motorist was actually had a different, he wasn't up to the stop sign where I was. He was a stop sign behind. So he actually had two stop signs to go through and still beat me to that side of the road. And um, 
and, and I'm just feel, I, I'm not sure, you know, and I'm a cyclist and I understand that I like to keep momentum going too. And it gets harder and harder on some of those hills to, to get moving forward. Um, however, I understand also when I'm cycling in town, that's a lot different than cycling on open road or on a trail where there is an easy pass through for cyclists. So I, I think we should play the um, the long game and do this right and um, create safe scenarios for everybody because even though the motorist would have been wrong in hitting me, um, I would have been dead. So I'd rather be alive than right. And also to address um, council member Yarborough's um, concerns, I think a lot of people that ride bicycles um, every day uh, do so because they cannot afford a car. And uh, that puts them at particular risk for injury and life threatening injury, especially. Thank you. Anyone else? Any more questions for Phil? Thank you so much for this feedback. It's very appreciated because um, it's good to hear what other people are thinking about this beyond our city staff. So appreciate it. And is this something that um, we think that staff should continue to bring up to us? House bills, Senate bills that may affect transportation. Are you interested in knowing that, Phil? Yeah. Okay. Yes, please. So. Please let us um, any anyone has any comments if you think this is a good idea or we can, we can time. We can take comments next month as well. Okay. We okay. Think about it a little bit more. And... Yeah, so give some thought to it. Yes, Steve. Yeah, I just posted uh, three things. So there's a DePaul study. There was a study done by Jason Meggs in Portland. Um, I gotta say the fact that Arkansas, Oklahoma, Utah, Idaho have all passed this law ahead of Colorado is, is actually kind of surprising to me, but they also cite that they were actually able to show a lower uh, um, percentage uh, of safety increase and in lowering in injuries because of the passing of the law. Idaho initially, and then um, I think the Arkansas article cites the other studies as well. So just to give you a sampling of some of the stuff that's already out there. Great, thank you, Steve. Thank you. thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, now it's time for uh, questions from, I mean, uh, comments from board members. Uh, Liz, would you like to begin? Thank you. Um, I don't have any comments. It's been a great evening. Thank you, Liz. Steve? Uh, yeah, it's been great, Phil. Uh, great information on, on all the projects that are coming up in front of Dr. Cog. Uh, interesting how they're separating it. Um, I agree with David in regards to uh, hopefully VMT is not the only criteria that's used. Multimodal uh, equity, uh, equality to, to access to transportation, I think, is also key. Uh, hopefully would be key factors that Dr. Cog would take into account. Uh, so all in all, I think it's been a very good night. Thank you. David? I would just thank staff for the interesting presentations. <clears throat> I've already asked my questions and made my comments. Thank you. Diane? Uh, well, thank you all for uh, stimulating discussion. Uh, I agree that I would like to hear more about these bills as they're, they're coming forward. I agree with David about consistency in the law is helpful. Um, and share concern about safety. And thank you, Steve, for posting those. I've copied them, I'll read them. Um, and council member Yarborough for uh, continually uh, making us think of the equity situation um, as it applies to transportation. And uh, Phil, thank you for your presentation and a better description of what VIA is doing, uh, the niche, niche that they provide uh, versus RTD. Um, yeah. It's been a great session, I think. Thank you. Courtney. Um, yes, I think it's been very informative and I would definitely be interested in uh, state laws that might change coming to the transportation board, uh, how they might affect our local um, 
situation and whether we would have comments to council uh, to make sure that it is applied well within the city is as, as long as it sounds like something we have a choice about so um, that would be interesting to keep up on as a transportation board so thank you for all the information um, yes, Phil, I as well um, agree, and I'm very interested in hearing about more uh, House bills or Senate bills that um, pertain to transportation. And I think that we've had really very thoughtful discussion, and um, I know that we probably could talk longer on how we view things, but um, people were very respectful of one another, and I appreciate all of that. And council member Yarborough, I really appreciated you bringing up the equity issue as well as safety is paramount in everything that we do. And um, uh, thank you. So now I'm gonna ask you council member Yarborough, do you have any additional comments that you'd like to make this evening? Um, no, you all are wonderful. Staff is great. Um, I'm so happy to be a part of this, this board um, learning so much. And um, I just keep doing the good work and I'm so excited for the future because the and creative people like you are on this board. Um, who would have thought the transportation would be so exciting. So. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Okay. Is there any upcoming information transportation related information that we need to know about Phil or Tyler? that is happening between now and our next meeting? If anything comes up, we will certainly send it okay. to you via email. We don't okay. have anything at this time pending, but things come up all the time, so we'll let you know. Okay. Keep hitting something here. Um, thank you. So our next meeting uh, is March the 14th. It's a month from today, and you have on the agenda that we'll have our annual RTD um, update and I appreciate the link that's going to be coming to us to make some comments to RTD before we meet because it's an interesting meeting with them from past years. Um, so anyway, uh, with that, is there anything else anybody needs to bring up? Tyler? Oh, I'll, I'll share my information. This will okay. uh, this will be my last EAB meeting here. Unfortunately, like Many others that have come before me, they're usually retiring, but um, I'm uh, leaving the city of Longmont, so I'll be. Uh, oh, I'll, I'll miss a lot of Longmont for the for the time being, and never say never. But um, it's been a pleasure working with this board, and so you'll be seeing more of Phil here for the next few months. Sorry, and, guys, and, and you're in good hands. So, may we uh, ask where you're headed? I'm going to be working for City of Fort Collins. Okay, not far away. As the city traffic engineer for Fort Collins. Well, we wish you well. Yeah, best wish of luck you. to you, Tyler. Thank you. Well, thank you thank very you much for your work. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Um, uh, may I have a motion to adjourn? Anybody want to move? I move that we adjourn for uh, the evening for our meeting. <laughs> so, and I, and I second the motion. Okay, everybody seconds it. <laughs> All right, we've been moved in a second and we're adjourned. We'll see you next month. Thank you. See y'all.